Happy Sabbath to you all, uh, to those watching, right? Uh, Most High Christ bless y'all. Um, we're going to continue, uh, Lord's will, today we should be able to wrap up the uh, fruits of self-control. That's what we've been going over. So uh, I want to do a little recap first though, right? So part one, we spoke about mastering of moods and restraint of reactions. Uh, and then we went over watching your words. Uh, and then we spoke about sticking to a schedule. Uh, we got to be mindful of that stuff. And then we spoke about managing money wisely, which we're going to talk about budgeting. And then we'll finish with maintaining good health. Okay. So uh, I, I still have a couple scriptures for budget, uh, but I want to do the budget link. But before I do the budget link, don't put it up. Let's read Proverbs 10 and 4. The book of Proverbs, chapter 10, verse 4. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. So it's not about how much you make as much as it is your diligence versus your slackness. It says, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, meaning a lack of discipline in managing your money wisely and not managing your funds correctly. And remember, a lot of that goes back to I mentioned how the tax term, where everybody's all excited and the money's gone in like a month or two with, with taxes, right? We, we, can you imagine every tax return you've gotten, depending how old you are, if you'd have done something productive with that, invested it, saved it, some of y'all still bouncing from apartments to apartments, and I'm sure many of you would like to buy a house, but you don't have the means for the down payment or whatever it is. If you didn't spend your tax return on sneakers, vacations, foods, electronics, everything else, and I'm not saying even all of it. There's strategies where you can keep a little to, set, to whet the appetite of that, I want to have stuff, and then it, it dulls the... Uh, uh, not want to say those the discipline, but rather it does the desire a little bit so that you, you can be disciplined enough to save the rest of that money. Uh, my wife and I have a plan where we're trying to eliminate a lot of our debt. When we moved out here, we sold our house in New York, and I said uh, we had a lot of debt. I said we're going to rent for a few years. We had a, I hadn't rented in 11 years. Right? I had owned my house all those years, maybe more. Um, I said we're going to rent for a few years, and we're going to aggressively pay down these debts. I said, because then we won't have the mortgage payment and stuff. So we paid them all down so that we can then qualify for the house. And that's a discipline that took us being on the same page on things. There was a lot of no, right? We would have discussions about what's a need and a want, right? She's looking, she's giving me that dead eyes, the straight eyes. Because she got the mask, so I can't see the face that she makes. Um, I had to have discussions with her because... Even though she understands what's the difference between a need and a want, it, to me, I'm big on the little subtleties. And her mouth was always, well, we need this and we need that. And I'm like, that's not a need. There's a difference between a need and a want. A need is this, a want is that, right? So, for example, we ain't got no rice. That's the only grain we got in the house, right? So we need rice, right? A want is I want the best, most expensive rice or whatever it is, or I want this or whatever. Now, that's oversimplifying it, but I'm just saying, right, there's a difference there. So even within what would seemingly be needs, there's measures and ranges within that. Anyway, the point is we were able to save up, uh, you know, whatever we have from the old house, whatever we paid down from the debt, we qualify, we got the house, right? So we got the house built. And then, like, in two months, we took on a whole bunch of debt because we wanted to do stuff to, with the house and other stuff and different things. So we found ourselves back in that position. So we've been uh, working on a strategy to do that. Uh, I got my tax return this year, and I said, man, I said, you know what? I've been looking at them home theater chairs that I want. They're a lot of money. It's a few grand. But it's, it's I was like, damn, these, they're Napa leather. It's... It's, it's like a it's like an heirloom piece. You know how they get you when they read. It's like, damn, these things is dope. They got little rockers in them, so it shake when you when the sound when somebody get punched in the throat, you feel it in the chair. I said, man, I really want these theater chairs. Look, my chair, the thing in the back, the fake leathers all peeling off. It got a lump. I had to buy a lumbar thing. Now I gotta buy a neck pillow. I'm like, damn, these things is getting jacked, right? I'm I'm justifying. I'm lining it up to justify the the purchase. Right. And 
Now, we have enough order in my house that my wife's not going to scream or have a big fit if I bought it. But she'll be like, okay. And then like three days later, be like, I need this. And it's a bunch of wants. <laughs> so I jokingly say when I buy something like that, I got to budget in what she's going to want too. So that I don't got to hear her mouth. Uh, but <laughs> I said, no, you know what? I have not made a payment on my student loans in five years. I've been deferring the hell out of those things. I said, I'm going to take this income tax money, and while, and while we're in this forbearance that the government put on that is not accruing interest, I said, I'm going to try to make a, 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 at least a few years worth of payments, at least get myself even, or if possible, knock it off. So between my stimulus money, between the tax money, if we get a second stimulus, I'm lined up to pay off almost 75% of my student loans with that money. Even though I want an outdoor kitchen, even though I want the theater chairs, she got a bunch of stuff that she wanting, but she going to Ross and cheap places to get it, so all praises. So <laughs> I say good, right? She's not like in Pier 1 Imports and stuff, trying to buy stuff there. The point is, I, it, I'm not saying it to boast of myself, but it takes a rationalizing process, even for those of us who seemingly are very good with budgets and finances and things like that. And I have the same impulses. I want stuff. I want to buy. I'm going to buy myself my PlayStation 5, even though I hardly play video games anymore, right? I hardly play, but I do, right? You manage. You balance those things. And it's all at... It's just different levels, right? So just because you see somebody that may seemingly have more, it don't mean that, you know, we used to say, if you see a doctor or a lawyer, they're usually just as broke, just at a higher level, right? So you ever heard that term, broke at a higher level? They, they, they got more, right? Because they live in that lifestyle, they spend more of that money. So you would think that the answer is make more money but when you make more, you're going to start to give more. So if you have more without the discipline in place when you had a little, the more is never going to help you. So you could say, well, if I could only make what that brother makes, if I could only earn what this sister earns, then I'll be okay. Not if you don't have the proper habits behind it. It's not going to work, right? So read this again, Proverbs 10 and 4, and then I want to ask about a budget. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. You... Nobody's a victim of circumstance. I'm not saying that there are jobs that pay crap, that there are expenses that are too much, but there are means and there are ways that you could put things into place to at least be okay. When you become poor, like broke down, homeless, near homelessness, things like that, it's because you have a slack hand. Come on. But the hand of the diligent maketh rich. But if you are diligent, you will figure out ways and rich is about perception. So you can think rich and you can think Solomon rich, Bill Gates rich, right? Um, Jeff Bezos, Amazon rich. Or it could be rich where you don't have the stress and worry of the bills, the bills are paid, you, most things that you need you're able to provide, and some things that you want you're able to get occasionally. To me that's rich. I don't gotta have a. I don't have to have ten cars. I don't have to right. I, 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 you would need to put all the things in place that are there, right? Um, and then you need to be able to see beyond that, right? Once you get yourself to that point, you got to see beyond that. The scripture says, "Build an inheritance." So now you need to be able to have enough to put away, right? Or use insurance, life insurance, different things to have things in place. Lord forbid something something should happen to you. So there's there's progressions through all of it, and rich is a relative term. Right? I, I often use the cracker, then you get cheese on the cracker, you think you're on the come up, then you could throw a little piece of meat on the cracker, woo! Now if you can take another cracker and make a cracker sandwich, right? So it's like, man, you know, it's, this is, I'm on the come up. So it's all relative to where you're at, right? Um, so now, uh, I asked the Shire last week what a budget was. Somebody else, tell me what a budget is. And then I want, I want like a thorough explanation, not just a definition. So first, define a budget. Um, so a budget is where you assess everything that's coming in and everything that's going out. Okay, everything that's coming in and everything that's going out. That is part of a budget. That is part of a budget. And then being able to allocate, prioritize what's important 
and then what would come after needs uh, okay along. all right so let me ask you this it's without like, giving me amounts how do you prioritize or do you I prioritize based on things that are necessities. So okay. So rent, what do, what do you what do you deem a necessity? Rent, food. What the scripture says, you need a house. Chief thinks shit. good, good, good. Can we read that real quick? That's a good one, right? That's a spiritual way to to organize your needs. The Bible calls them the chief things in life. The Book of Sirach, chapter twenty nine, verse twenty one. The chief thing in life is for life is water. And bread and clothing and in house to cover shame. Right? So your house, right? Food, clothing, okay? Things of that nature. Go ahead. So you would use that. Um, and then we need things that you need to get things done. So, for instance, the uh, like your phone. You got to mm -hmm. have a phone to be able to function with work. Mm -hmm. with, yeah, well, especially nowadays, food. right? Yeah, you got to have cell phone. Even if it is a little cricket, Metro PCS or... What's the joint you got, Nehemiah? I ain't even heard of your company. Metro POS. Crowdfunding something. What the hell? Consumer sell you. I don't even know what the hell that is. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's is that the phone you get in like you uh, Circle K? <laughs> 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 uh, Off the rack. <laughs> um, so what else do you have on a budget? Go ahead. Uh, and then priorities that you need to... Uh, basically have to help make your life okay, easier. Okay, so, so let me ask you something. How do you physically keep track of those priorities? Writing or are you? Do, I, you? do you? I do, I do. I have, a, I have a calendar on the wall, so uh -huh. when I walk out of the house, I can see that calendar. Okay. And then, um, and what's on that calendar in reference to your budget? Um, I write down what bills are for the month, uh -huh. and then I write down what my goals so are. So you write their due dates? Do you ever total the bills the, for the I month? I write the due dates on when they have to be paid, uh -huh. and then I try to prioritize having them paid now before it even gets to the uh -huh. dates. Do you write the totals of them? Yeah, the totals on the top. All right, of all the bills? All the bills. And so then together, bottom, so you know that month, this is, this how, is much how much I'm to, spending I on these bills. I this amount to make Good, okay, you're, you're further along than most people. Okay, yeah. all right, okay, not bad. Anybody else? Budget, 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 budget. I want definition. No, but like right now, you know, um, instead of buying like the main brand stuff, you know, uh, we go for the generic, you know, budget with that. Even okay. That coupon so you're telling there. me that's some of the ways you budget. Right. So your wife is major couponing. amazing at couponing, right? Yes. So, so y'all don't even got to pay for food. No, we got a bunch of cereal. So, you know. Right. So worse right. come to worse. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So, so, so you have nourishment. I mean, you may want some variety and you get tired of cereal, right? But if push comes to shove, you could get a lot of cereal for free. That's it. Okay. Yeah. All right. How do you apply a budget in your household? Because uh, you're a little different because you're married and you both uh, normally, I know there's different things going on right now, but normally mm -hmm. you both have incomes coming in. So how do yeah. you guys as a married couple do your budget? Uh, basically, uh, to tell because that's another, I'm sorry, that's another dynamic to it, brothers. And some of y'all like the benefits of marriage, but you want to treat the money like y'all still single. And that goes on both sides. Where we want flesh, but not with my check. Go ahead. Uh, I want a little bit better with budgeting than I am. She is? She is, yeah. So do you let her do that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you right. don't you don't try to say I'm the man and I'm gonna do the budget even though you suck at it. Look, if you're better with money than I am, go ahead. Good, all praises. Do you know there's a lot of brothers that don't have that spirit? Right. They 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 have a, a an excessive preeminent spirit, mm -hmm. even to their destruction. That's another form of slackness that'll make you poor. If your wife is better at the finances, let your wife run the finances. Right. You still have your authority, your preeminence as the man in the house. I mean, listen, you can do whatever the hell you want. Thanks. But if you want to actually improve your situation and she better at it, then let her be the one to do it. So go ahead. So your wife runs it. So, yes. so would she be better to speak to me about a budget? Do you just kind of be like, here, boo, here's my check? Hey, you know, sometimes you got to do that. No, but at the same time, like, when it comes to the kids, the kids like, nah, they don't need that. You know what I mean? Just get generic okay. stuff. Right. Uh, main thing, don't try to eat out. Try to cook. Okay. Don't, don't All right, so you're talking about strategies right. to conserve money. That's not a budget. Oh. So it's, it's clear that your wife is the one that has the financial acumen in the house, and I don't say that as an insult. You said oh, no, it yourself. Okay. So all right. You know, one thing I noticed everybody kind of universally said, uh, and, and, and they think that that's the first piece of the budget, is the due dates 
and the dates they do being written down. That's only one aspect of the bigger picture. I find most people don't go the further thing. So I'll give you briefly just a, a very br brief budget. Like if I sit down with somebody to do budgeting with them, even outside of software and things, separate your expenses. First of all, use your guidance of the scriptures, chief things, right? And then you need to separate them from things. Have you ever heard terms like fixed expenses? Right? So now you're getting more granular. The things that are the same amount every month, right? that they don't vary. Right? So your rent is going to be the same. Your car payment, your insurance, unless you get into an accident. Your insurance or whatever. Right? You have fixed expenses. Then you have variable. Your water bill, your light bill. Right? Uh, the food bill could be variable. It depends on how your shopping is. Or it could be fixed. Right? Listen, I'm spending 200 every two weeks and no more than that. And that's up to you whether you stay within that or not. So there's room within there because it's fixed and variable. So you need to put your things under fixed and variable. And then you need to start product. If you really want to get good at a budget, how many of you actually put your haircut in your budget? How many of you actually put your gas, which is a variable expense, right? Because sometimes it'll be 45. Unless you can make it a fixed expense when you're like, I'm only putting a half a tank every week no matter what, right? Then it could be that too. But... If not, if you're filling it up, it could be variable, right? Because it depends on how empty it was when you went. Um, things like haircuts, toilet paper, toiletries, soap, toothpaste, right? Uh, if you got kids, there's a bunch of things you might need for them, right? And if they're little babies, diapers. Wow, that's expensive, right? So you got to go through all these little things. You can't just say, I got rent, I got the light, I got this, and then the rest of it. Whatever. And that, that's usually more single brothers that roll that way. Look, see, he's smirking over there as I'm saying it. Now, you're a little more responsible. Well, you, you make good money. Your job, for the job that you do, society-wise, seemingly, it would be crazy. I, I think any job, as long as you're working, right, that's legal, is good. I've said this before. But some people look at what you do. I'm not going to say it. That's up to you if you want to say it. And be like, damn, that's, that's a crap. Let me tell you something. He making more than a lot of y'all with, with a better sounding job, and he got medical benefits So because of the company that he worked with, right? So I know you're a little different, right? You, you're, you're a little more in control of your money uh, in some extent. And I know there's some other brothers that they just don't know how to handle that stuff, right? So that's different. Um, so there's different aspects of the budget, but it starts with things like that, right? Like really sitting down, putting everything down. Then you break that out by due date so you can time the other thing. One thing that I also noticed too is that a lot of people, when you're um, immature in budgeting, you'll wait to pay things on the due date. But if your cash flows are good and the money is there, you start to time it around when your check comes in and not when they tell you to pay it. Meaning you don't pay it late, but there's nothing wrong with paying it early if it meets the coincides with when you have more money in the account. Mm -hmm. and, that, and what that does is that smooths out the peaks and valleys in, in your spending, right? So this is all different ways that you can look at managing money wisely. And there's, I'm not going to say that, I've said there's universal principles for budgeting, but there's not really a universal budget that everybody, because there's different things. Some people might have a medical condition and they have a higher expense with medicine and things that they need. There's other types of aspects that go into that, right? So pull up the budgeting link. And there's plenty. I just figured this one seemed the most simplified if anybody wanted to use it as a resource, right? Uh, and we'll just go through some of it, right? So it says how to make a budget. Uh, take the fear out of budgeting with our step-by-step -step guide to crafting a budget you can really live with. First step, relax. Because you don't know how many people I've helped that have asked me, and it's usually, the people are very resistant to a budget, and I think there's this, it's kind of like uh, when you have the fear of the doctor, but from the perspective of you figure if you don't know the diagnosis, then... <laughs> don't exist, that you're sick. And there's a lot of people that are like that. Well, I don't want to know what's wrong with me, so I don't want to go, right? You're, and you might know that there's something really wrong with you, but you're afraid to find out what it is, right? Same thing with the budget. Relax. Be easy. It says, before you do anything, take a deep breath and relax. Feel better? We're not here to make the perfect budget or change your financial world overnight. We'll get to that later. For now, we need to put a budget together that we can work with There'll be plenty of time to reflect and make changes later. The second step says, choose how you want to budget. So this is what I said. There's different ways that you can do this, right? It says, it's best to start your budget with the information you already know. I usually recommend starting with separating your expenses into fixed and variable and write them all down. That's the most simplified way because you're only going into two categories there. 
Later, as you get more granular, you can add, separate them out more, right? There's subcategories to the fixed and variable. So it says option A, you can budget off past spending if you have a history of how your spending is, right? Scroll down. So it says there's different categories that you can do, right? Uh, once you've organized your spending, use that information to create your envelopes. So this is, they have like a system here with envelopes and budgets and they have some stuff here with theirs, right? It doesn't have to be this. I just use them because I think their language was not financial speak. I think a lot of times you'll look for budgeting things and if you're not versed in that stuff, you, it, it, it can demotivate you from wanting to do your budget. This website in particular, it was very plain, the language and what they were saying, right? Um, so look, they, they separated into needs and wants, right? So you see needs, uh, they have percentages there, grant, utilities, groceries, eating out, entertainment, hobbies, right? So yes, single brothers, eating out is not a necessity, it is a want. The, what I think uh, Eliezer was saying it, it, eating out less actually helps you keep more, because I get it, when you're single, right, you just... It's just easier, it's more convenient, right? And, and then usually you got your spots that you like and it's good and that's it, right? But if you kind of prepare food at home more, right, you'll be in a better state. I see you, uh, you be doing that because you get the discount, you, get the, you buy the stuff in bulk, right? I see you. And he's like, this is going to be my, but he real plain with it. He, he, he'll have like tuna fish, brown rice, and veggies. This is my lunch every day this week. And I'm like, God, you so that, that's like diet food. Feasting. I'm like, yeah, he's like feasting. feasting. He's like, <laughs> I know you do. I'm not saying that's your only meal, but I'm saying the variety. Like, you're just like, that's it. I'm eating brown rice six times for lunch this week. Hashtag I'm eating tuna fish. And ain't nothing wrong with that, but I'm just like, yeah. So what do you get? What do you like for fast food? Some Chick-fil-A? Jesus chicken? Yeah. Well, that's right. See, that's why I like you. Mm. I won't be so... Bad with you when you bring your planner later because you said Chick-fil-A and not Popeyes. All right, so you got needs, utilities, groceries is a need, eating out, entertainment, hobbies, right? And uh, they tell you here different things, debt payments, and how the budget comes down. Scroll, scroll. Uh, loans, uh, savings. You should put savings. I know, especially when you're not making a lot of money. Like, man, I can't save no money. I will tell you this, and you're going to have different financial people that have different types of advice. It makes no sense with the depreciation of money and the interest that you could potentially earn to save money if you have credit cards with interest rates of 15, 16, and 17 percent. You are better off aggressively paying your debt down. That alone puts 17 percent more money in your pocket if your interest rate is 17 percent or something like that, right? So you're better off paying the debt than trying to save money. Like, really, get more aggressive with the debt. Because worst case, and this is a very rudimentary form, is another rule that they put out. They used to say three months of living expenses. They say ideally six. You have short-term savings. These are more complexities of budgets. Short-term saving, long-term, so on and so forth. You have short-term savings, which is like for emergencies, and then you have longer term, which is for like bigger goals, like buy a house, retire, whatever it is. Worst case scenario, after you pay those cards off, that can be your emergency funds until you build your emergency funds of three to six months of expenses. That way, when you lose a job, it's not so hard. Unemployment is not designed to re replace your income unless it's corona, right? Then they give you more. But unemployment, I, listen, what is it, like 240? When I found out it was like 240 out here is the max? I thought New York was bad. It's like 400 is the max in New York, which is like 100, which is like 240 here. No, 400 in New York is crappy too. Um, 240 is like the max out here. So unemployment is not a, is not a, a, a security. Uh, it's not an emergency fund. It's not good. Right? 240, 240 is horrible. <laughs> it's like, I don't, know, I don't know how they can give that to people and call it unemployment. No, and then if you take taxes out, it's like 200. No, you better not take taxes out because you can opt not to. Uh, but what were you saying? What were you saying? No, not during Rona. Well, no, now that's done. That ended Friday. That ended yesterday. The kicker's gone. No, they they arguing about it right now while everybody's struggling. So, um, so you want to have emergency funds, and they say it should be three to six months of expenses. But um, don't do savings. That's just one. Like I said, you're gonna hear people say different things. I don't think it's worth it to save if you're if you have ridiculous interest rates. You're better off paying that down aggressively, and then focus on saving money. And don't use those 
credit funds unless it's for an emergency. Uh, so it says, don't worry about the numbers. Those are guesstimates. All right, scroll, scroll, scroll. Option B, create a budget based on your income. Uh, I think if you've never dealt with detailed budgeting before, that is a better option. This Again, this is just my opinion. Instead of going by past spending, this is a better option. Um, even better is a hybrid of the two. So you take the aspect of your past fixed and variable bills and throw that into your income and then make adjustments on the ones that you're able to where you can, right? So, for example, some people like to go for a haircut every three weeks. Some like to go every four. If the haircut doesn't fit in the budget with your income, you might need to stretch that bad boy out to six or eight weeks, right? And just look a little puffy. Take in the hand. Into your own hands. Or take matters into your own hands and then eliminate that expense altogether, right? Get a Floby. You remember Floby? You remember Floby because you older. The self haircut thing? They had the infomercial? Come on, man. You were in the East Coast too. That thing was big. It was like a it was like a it was like a a, a clippers with like a vacuum. Right. And 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 it had like a guy. See, my brother knows. See, you, you gotta be like 40 plus to remember Floby. If you didn't, you don't know. And it was like and you could do your own haircut without having any type of skill or knowledge to do a haircut. Floby. They need to run that back with Corona. <laughs> and then now with technology, you could probably like see the back of your fade, have like a little bar, like it gets real red. Nope, you could jack up the line, right? Or just <laughs> right? Wouldn't that be helpful? Right? I know Issachar gives a good fade. He cannot cut the top of hair for nothing. Everybody's gonna look the same. No, he warned me. Fit, fit, and he warned me. He said, "Listen, man, I don't, I'm just gonna throw clippers <laughs> off the top of your hair. Which number?" <laughs> Same thing. I picked a high number because I didn't want it real short. I didn't know. It still came out real short. I said, damn. Buzz cut. The fade was, the fade was good, though. He thought I was Judah. He gave me a, didn't give me a Judah fade first? I said, come on, no, man. Right? And yeah. So budget based on your income. Uh, it's based on your income. Proactively assigns a role for each dollar you make. Again, my opinion, I think that's a better option, especially if you feel like you don't make enough money, right? It's a great way to manage your money, and it's also the best way to make sure you're not spending more than you make. And that's the most important part. Because you would think, even if you don't, you think the only way to spend more than you make is by credit. That's not true. You spend more than you make when you don't have money to pay the next bill or pay the rent or whatever because you didn't set it up right, right? Because one of the number one requests we get for help is not for food, it's not for the light bill, it's not even for the car payment. Everybody wants us to pay their rent. First of all, you're not in the spirit because the spirit says the chief things in life is a house to cover shame. So your rent should be paid before anything else. And then we are able to help more people with the other stuff when you messed up. And we changing the way money requests happen anyway. We got a nice new form. It, it, people get defensive when you start asking. They ask for help and then we go and ask questions Right, because we want to know if we throw money in a black hole. Are we? Are you gonna need help again next month? Are you gonna need help again the month after that? And everybody gets defensive. Well, why do I gotta answer all these questions? Because you asking something from us, and it's up to us to make sure that the money is distributed properly. I will make sure I'm not. We're not feeding a habit, or whatever it might be. So we gotta ask those questions. So the new budget form is gonna ask some questions. We're gonna give pushback because some people come in here and just try to get well. If I could get the school to pay my rent this month, I could buy the PlayStation 5 next month. Damn. Evil people that'll do some stuff like that. Uh, they talk about a 50, 20, 30, 20 breakdown, needs, wants. I think you can't really go by percentage because it depends. Now, what the other way you look at this is that as a guideline, 50% of your income should go to needs, 30% should go to wants and 20 to savings. It all depends, right? So go ahead, scroll down. Let's see what else they got here. Uh, evaluate. So after you sit down and write all this stuff down, now you can get a better view of your budget, right? Uh, notice how it says, think about the whole year instead of just one month. Think about, I would say, think about one month instead of just the two-week pay period because a lot of y'all think your budget is on a brown paper bag, write the list of bills, write how much your check is going to be that day, and that's it, right? And what gets paid gets paid, what doesn't doesn't, right? No, don't, it don't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Let's keep scrolling down. There's more stuff here. We're not going to go over that now. Uh, and then, of course, just give it a try, right? Set the budget. Give it a try. I like this one. It's four simple steps. Gets you started. Gets you going. If you want to do more complexities, you can. 
Hopefully the broadcast team does not drop the ball. I asked to put up the images from last week, and they were not put up on the announcements group. They are still not up on the announcements group. Hopefully you can put this link up this week, broadcast team. Thank you. All right. Yeah, They got notes in there now to put it up. All right. Make sure that you share the links that we share in class. Put it up on the announcements group. And, and it's up to them if they want it. Some people may want it, right? I know someone was asking about the four agreements from last week. Hey, and we got to do it like right after class because people might want to go study. They, maybe they're inspired after the class and they feel hot. They want to make some changes. Now you wait three weeks and say, oh, by the way, here. Now they're back into their bad habits. Stop. All right. <laughs> so read Proverbs 13 and 22. That's the budgeting, all right? By no means is this all encompassing. I could sit down and I could show you how to balance a check register, how interest works and all that stuff. Um, but... That's outside the scope of the class. Proverbs 13, 22. The book of Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 22. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. So it says a good man will leave an inheritance for his children's children. Now, is that really possible? I mean, I think it depends on how much the inheritance is, right? Like, what are you talking about? Again, it's all relative. Rich can mean for you mean, you know... Mayweather rich, right? I was watching a video the other day. He's like, this one. didn't even know how to work the lights in his house for his closet. It, it, like two minutes of the video, I'm waiting. Cause, and the only reason I watched it, because I actually don't like his spirit when it comes to that. that is separate from his boxing. I just don't like his spirit and how he roll. Um, because he had mad shoes in the closet. And I like shoes, as me and Atniel just figured out. Let's, let's go, go shoe shopping one day. So, <laughs> and he had, it, man, it was just a crazy setup. You can only imagine because it's him and you know how he is. So, if, and if you don't know how he is, go look and you'll see how he is. Man, and the closet was crazy. The closet looked like the whole first floor of my house. And then, right, and now, I know, and some people be talking about, oh, man, Yashua's house. No, man, his closet was my house, all right? And he couldn't figure out how to work the lights. But anyway, uh, he had, like, the whole shoes in there and all set up, that might be rich for you is my point, right? You might, it, right? So an inheritance, it depends. But the Bible says you should build to that. So we got it. It's more than just looking at a week out, a month out, a year out. What's the future like should life last, right? Longer. We can't, we can't try to time that thing ourselves. So it's, like, it's almost like you got to have the go bag ready, but still plant your vineyards, build, do all that stuff. And part of that means building an inheritance. How many of us that are parents can actually say we're thinking about leaving something for our children and not about today's bills only? All right? Okay, good. Good. That's not, should have been everybody's hand. Right? It should have been everybody's hand. So, and that's if you're a parent. If you're not a parent, that's fine. Uh, but you want to leave an inheritance. The Bible commands us to do so. It says, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just, right? So, um, Going back into this time, is talking about when they would take spoils of stuff, right? Remember, this is David talking about taking spoils. But it says, you're going to leave an inheritance for your children. Let me get Sirach 14 and 3. So that's part of managing money wisely, which is why I included that. We must think of leaving something behind. You men that want to travel, go international and things like that, you should have life insurance before you travel. Listen, it's only by the grace of the Most High that we return from these things unscathed, no issues. But if the Most High wants to give you death on one of those trips or plane to go down or whatever it is, you should have something in place. And you can't say, well, I'm waiting to save money. That's what life insurance is for. And you need to put something in place. Listen, it's going to be hard enough as it is for your spouse to have to deal and your children with the sudden loss of, of you as a person in their life, as the father or whatever it is in, your, in, in, in their life. Um, and then for your wife to be distraught trying to figure out what to do with money? You never really loved your family then. You're going you're gonna to leave that. Listen, the congregation is going to do what we can to look out for them, but you're going to leave that responsibility to us? That's, that's not how you should be rolling. So there's so much more, there's so much maturity that goes with dealing with money and, and, and creating that, 
stream of whatever it is, right? And I'm not sitting here talking about being wealthy or anything. I'm just talking about basic stuff so that they can have something, you know? And you have that discussion with whoever you decide to get life insurance with. That's the great thing about insurance as a, as a tool. It's not an investment. It's a tool as you, as you build your inheritance. If you're single, you don't need that much. Maybe have enough just to cover maybe any debts you would have in your burial, right? And then as you get married, now you got to consider that. If you have a house, now you should have a lot more to maybe at least cover the mortgage should you pass, right? Because you probably base that projection on both of you making money, right? And then now if you have kids, you got to say, well, damn, I need to make sure they have enough till they're at least 18. And maybe I want to put things in place till they're a little older than that. So now it could, get, it could get up there. And guess what else? You want to talk about synergy. If you don't want to pay a lot of money on that insurance, your health better be good. So that you don't say, damn, I can't get the amount that I need for that. So you see how all of this starts to play a, a, a complete role in how we navigate this world? The fruits of self-control. Uh, so, <clears throat> Sirach 14 and 3. The book of Sirach, chapter 14 <coughs> and verse 3. Riches are not comely for a niggard. And what should an envious man do with money? Mm, it says, define niggard. Because people are not going to say, riches are not comely for a niggard. I told you to define the guard. Let's pull it up. Okay. Scroll down. A stingy or ungenerous person. Niggardly, right? So it says ungenerous. So read the verse again. Riches are not comely for a niggard. Listen, if you are a stingy or ungenerous person, more money is not going to do anything for you. So some of y'all be like, well, I hold back because I don't have enough. No, you're probably a niggard. That's probably what's really going on there. Because more money's not going to fix the problem. There's a saying in the world, they say, money magnifies just who you are. So if you were a good person and you got rich, you'll be an even better person. If you were a niggard and you got rich, you'd probably be more of a niggard, right? When it comes to that stuff. Hey, didn't, I'll, correct me if I'm wrong. I think there's somebody go to Floyd, speaking of Floyd one time, talking about why don't he give money to black causes? And he said, the hell with all that, I'm about to get mine. And I'm not saying those black causes are anything good, right? Like, we know that that's all BS. You got something out there? What was it that was said? He said, um... He a nigga. He said, why don't you give back to... They asked, why don't you give back to Africa? And he said, Africa's never done anything for me. Right. He got that yeah, type of mentality. That's a nigga. That's a nigga. Right? So, you know, stingy, ungenerous person. Right? So it says, money's not comely for a nigger. A nigger ain't going to do what's right with that. Remember, the scripture says we work so that we can have for those that don't. All right? And that's the whole cycle of what we do with the alms. Right? I'm not going to go into all that, but like uh, you read in Acts how they said they had all things common. Uh, money was given, uh, placed at the feet of the apostles, and they distributed as everybody had need. Right? That's why I say, again, going back, it makes me laugh when I hear brothers and sisters talk about uh, uh, black economics, let's do Israelite economics, and it's just an idea. There's nothing else behind it. There's no reality behind it. It's not fleshed out. I tell you, 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 you got to know the spirit and whether these people have the fruits of self-control. and how. Now, I'm not saying we can't supply things for our people. I'm not saying that that should be an excuse not to do it. I'm just saying that you can't just run into business with anybody, no matter if it's, you know. Listen, if it was, if it was the other races, you'd probably be, make sure you want everything in writing. Why should it be any different here? Remember, nobody's right. Everybody got something off. And especially when it comes to money, I mean, some of us have lived it and seen it. Some of us have seen it just in how they stereotypically portray us. Money's at the root of all the divorces, all the different, all the killings amongst uh, people. At the end of the day, that's what it really boils down to, right? It goes all into that stuff. So you got to be mindful of that. Let me get Proverbs 30 and 8. The book of Proverbs, chapter 30 and verse 8. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Right, so this is a good spirit to have, right? I don't want to be, see, in the world, I wanted to be rich. I was chasing riches. Um, before this truth, I was moving up the ranks in banking. I was a vice president in the bank, and 
I was like, man, I, I had my whole thing mapped out. I said, I'm going to move up. I'm going to be an executive. I'm going a, I'm to a roll like them, right? I'm going to be doing all this. The truth changed my perspective on that. And it's, this is the mindset we should have. We don't want poverty, right? Because Christianity would teach you it's righteous to be poor. No, you don't want poverty, but you don't want riches, right? And he's going to explain why. You don't want to be at the extreme. I don't want Mayweather money. I've, I, I want to believe, I've said this before, whether I hit the lotto or whatever, I want to believe I would do right with all that. Because I like, at what point, I was thinking, so I, back to the video before we read the next verse. So finally, when he got the lights to work in the video to show me all his kicks, it became less impressive to me as I saw him talking and showing me more. Because at first, so, so, so the first thing was, was my carnal because my, my spirit wasn't ready as the video popped up. And I saw, this, I saw the sneaker closet. I said, oh, damn. I like the way he got them displayed and laid out. And then as he was showing them, I said, he probably never even wear some of them shoes. He said, this ain't even his primary house. He probably got shoes in another house. And I started to think, and I said, gosh, that really is excessive. I said, how many shoes you got? And then he went and he had eight cars. And I said, I mean, now, mind you, you probably want to experience all that. So uh, maybe, I, maybe I'll rent the car just to see what it's like, right? Or maybe, you know what I'm saying? But just to keep it and have that expense. And, but I saw the sneakers, and I, I didn't finish watching it. It was like a 14-minute long video. And so I was like, I was, I'm, I'm going to go watch this. You remember that show, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, back in the day? That thing was like a hit show, right? And then they did MTV Cribs for the ghetto version, right? So they did. That's, that's what MTV Cribs was, if you didn't know. That was for Jake, right? Because Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous was... Uh, damn, what was that white man's name, man? That He had the, uh, the accent. Robin Leach. This is Robin Leach. And this is Lifestyle. Do, do, do. <laughs> and they had the camera shot. They before drones, so they had the helicopter camera shot and everything like that. All right, Robin Leach. Lifestyles of the Rich. And then they did MTV Cribs, like, for, for the rest of us. <laughs> hey. All right. So... <laughs> As I was watching it, I, I was less impressed. And I said, gosh. So it's like I went through the whole thing in like a matter of a couple minutes where I was like, damn, that was the lust of my eyes. And then I saw it and I just realized that that, and literally my mind started shifting to like, gosh. And then, and then listen, I'm not saying he didn't have Nikes, but it's, it wasn't really like it was Versace. It was all this crazy, like I said, they probably had some. So these, he probably paid thousands for some of these shoes, right? And he literally had hundreds, if not thousands, in this closet that was as big as my house, right? And I was just like, gosh, there's so much more that can be done with this. This is what the scripture's talking about when it speaks about that mentality. You don't want poverty. You don't want those riches. I'd like to believe I'd do good things with all the money. And maybe initially I would. But only God really knows, right, what we're going to do. You think you got the plan. Sometimes I, sometimes I drive. You see the billboard. I'm like, damn, 500 million in the mega. 248 after taxes if I take the lump sum. I'm like, damn, how many houses can I build for people? And, whatever. and right, and I, I usually think of others first. And I'm like, damn, I'll take care of this, I'll do that. And then I'm like, oh, I don't know. I said, that thing is, that, it, it's, there's still a lot of money left over. I don't know what I'm going to do with that. Right? Or let's say I don't go back into sin. Maybe I neglect the work. Maybe I'm not as passionate for whatever it is the most high God in store for me, right? Even if I had those well intentions, only God knows. I got to believe that's why none of us is winning the damn lotto. So even if you play. I, oh, no, correction. I win $1, $5. <laughs> right? I get something here or there, you know? So I'll never hit on a scratcher. <laughs> never. <laughs> no, nah, I don't mess with the scratches. Them things are real crack. <laughs> I play the regular stuff. Go ahead, officer. Scratches, you be this. Crosswords never hit. <laughs> Hey, Cap, I know um, that's one of the main reasons I hadn't been able to get my business off the ground. Because mm -hmm. I hadn't really learned how to command my house like Abraham. Yeah. That's because I already know what I would have used my business to kind of avoid dealing with things I need to deal with in my house. Right, right. Yeah, see, I mean, there's a lot that goes into that. Go ahead, officer. And it's interesting that you say that about commanding your house like Abraham. Um, Remember, it, it's, it's, it's levels to it, right? You got to be right first. Then your house got to be right. Because right? maybe you good, right? And the money ain't going to come because your wife ain't right. And you think she right. She might seemingly everything be good. But God's like, no. I know what's going to happen to that woman, right? Maybe it's your kids. Maybe they grow up bratty and demonic and some crazy stuff coming at. Go ahead. What are you going to say, officer? Yeah, that's heavy. We said about the whole lotto. Because a lot of us get our tax 
pants and check. And we don't Come, do. Is it because you too far from I the think thing? The battery's about to die. Okay, go ahead. But uh, a lot of us get a tax return and a stimulus and still don't do things for the body with that money. No, so you're right. Just imagine, right. like, if we right. want a lot of. Yeah, listen, and I'm not saying you got to give all that. Remember, it's all part of the budgeting, right? You you put a portion towards that and stuff like that. Nobody say. Remember, when you read an Acts, it says those that had. Houses, meaning plural, they had extra. The point was they had extra. They didn't say they sold their house and became homeless to help the church, right? But I, I'm just saying you would think, and I know many of us have that intention, that damn, I, I'm going to look out. I would want to do this. I want to free up some of the leadership so they can teach more and whatever. You don't know. Hey, we might pollute others by doing something like that. And just now we're giving them too much money to do stuff. See, and then I, I'm thinking I got it foolproof. And I'm like, I'm not giving the money. I'm doing an annuity. It's only going to put out this much, whatever. Only God knows, right? Read verse 9. Now he says it. This is the point. Verse 9. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? So he said, don't give me poverty because, and don't give me riches. Because if you give me riches, I might be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Come on. Or lest I be poor and still, and take the name of my God in vain. And he says, lest I be poor, and because of that poverty, I'm driven to steal. And as a result, because that's what it means to take God's name in vain, is that to profess God, to say you're like that, and then not do what he says, right? Uh, Christianity at large is like that. They profess God, they profess Christ, blood of Jesus, and they don't do zero one of that. So he says, I don't want to be so poor that I, I take your name in vain and I don't want to be so rich that I forget you, basically, is what he's saying. And that's what will happen. Money will become our God. All right. That's it on money. We're going to go into maintain good health and we should be able to wrap it from there. So rock 3016. A lot of these we've gone through, but all of these go together. I would even take it a step further and say, you see how it's last on the list? I look at it as the foundation that holds up the rest of those. You have to be in good health to have the sound mind, to have the emotional health, to have the physical, the wherewithal, and all that stuff to be able to deal with the rest of these things. Because it's taxing to deal with the spirits and the moods. It's taxing to deal with the words and be mindful. It's disciplining to deal with the schedule and managing the money and stuff like that. And it'll take a toll physically on you. So we must manage our health, right? And that is a thing of discipline. There should not be excuses for that. Yes, there are things that may make it more challenging if you have a sickness or whatever, but there is a means and a way and a disciplined approach to do so. So go ahead, Sirach uh, 30. The book of Sirach, chapter 30, verse 16. There is no riches above a sound body. So even though we were just talking about money and stuff, it says there's no riches above a sound body. That's why I say that one is the foundation for everything. You must have a sound body. Come on. And no joy above the joy of the heart. Meaning, you're not being depressed, not having worries, not having anything in your mind to mess you up. The heart is your mind. He says, there's no joy above the joy of the heart. Let me get uh, 3 John 2. 3 John. The book of 3 John, verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. Right, so... It says, the health of the body. He says, above all things, I wish this. So we want that to be above anything else. Right? And I've often spoke about health. It's not just the absence of sickness, but feeling a certain way, having a general sense of wellness. And it's not just physical, right? Because when you get sick, even if it's not like super debilitating, uh, let's say it's a nagging cold that sticks around for three weeks. It impacts you. You got less energy. As a result of less energy, now your mindset ain't right. Maybe you're more irritable. Now it affects your appetite. So now you throw in the hormones that deal with the hunger and everything. It's just like a perfect storm of nastiness, right? So help is important. We want to be in a good state of health. Did I, did I said do the definition for that? You want to bring it up? Okay. The, uh, but I like that. That's good. The condition of being sound in body, mind, I would say, and spirit, not or. I think it's all of those, right? Most people go by this part, freedom from physical disease or pain. Health is more well-rounded than that, right? So it's a condition of being sound in body, mind, and I would say, and spirit, not or. Uh, let's go back to Sirach 30 and now start at 15. The book of Sirach, chapter 30 and verse 15. Health and good estate of body are above all gold, 
and a strong body above infinite wealth. Right. So what's what's all the money in the world count if you're sickly, right? And everything else that comes with sickness that we spoke about. Read on. There is no riches above a sound body and no joy above the joy of the heart. Come on. Death is better than a bitter life of continual sickness. Death is better than a, a bitter life of continual sickness. Letting you know that if you're always in a state of sickness, if you're always getting sick, if you're not in a good state of health, you become bitter. Mm. You become bitter. So he says he calls it a bitter life if you're continually in sickness. Uh, let's jump down to verse 21. Verse 21. Give not over thy mind to heaviness, and afflict not thyself in thine own counsel. People who are always in their head, worrying about stuff. It says, don't give your mind over to heaviness. Overly concerned. There's a difference between awareness and taking action and giving yourself over. Meaning what? Succumbing to that. Doesn't mean that heaviness won't come. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have counsel in your own mind. It says, just don't give yourself to that. Remember, I said we're all entitled to our emotions and the things we feel, but what we do with them. That's why it's called the mastering of moods. You need to know how to control those things. I made the joke with Big Poppy, which is suffer from depression? Don't. Now, I know science will tell you it's a chemical imbalance and there's all other things like that. The scripture tells you there's ways to deal with it before it gets to that. That's, those are the extreme cases of depression. It becomes a chemically rooted thing in you spiritually when you've given yourself over to it. If you address it before it gets to that, you're not going to need the medicine and all that stuff for that. We've gone over this before. Listen, follow your doctor's advice, right? None of us here are, are, are well, none of us here teaching now are health professionals and stuff like that. And even within that, there's so much context that goes into giving out health advice, right? We got to be mindful, especially those of us that sit in rank positions of... What, even if your intent is not to give advice, what may seem like any type of health advice. Because we don't know what everybody else is dealing with, what they have, and they may try what's worked for you and your physiology is somewhat different than theirs, right? Um, but when it comes to things like depression, it's not to, it's not to uh, minimize that depression can be a very heavy burden for people. Uh, I think Bishop's been on record and we've said it. If you're at the point where you have to take medicine for that, that's fine. But then you need to try to find a way to wean yourself off of that, right? Because you're putting yourself in, in a state where you have not learned to control or master that thing. And it's the fine line that some of us walk that are in, in science as professions and spiritual, right? It's like, well, the data says this, but you got to know where the root of that comes from. I'm not saying that there isn't something physically going on in there, but where is the influence that's triggering it? And we understand that when it comes to a lot of these things, it deals with uh, spirits, um, different types of emotions that come upon you, right? Uh, come on, read. Verse 22. Verse 22. The gladness of the heart is the life of man, and the joyfulness of a man prolongeth his days. Right, so happiness prolongeth your days. This is the gladness of the heart is the life of man. That's what's going to prolong your days. Not having a heavy mind, always being down, always being worried, always being depressed. Come on. Love thine own soul. Oh, you hear that all the time. You got to love yourself, girl. You got to love yourself. That's why he can't love you because you don't love yourself. But no, love yourself. It says love thine own self. And what is that really going into? Don't let your health go on the way. If you really cared about yourself... You would do better for yourself. You would put the things in place to be disciplined enough to apply all these things if you loved yourself. Otherwise, you're just voicing it out. Oh, I love myself. Bro. Don't matter. You got to take the actions behind that. Come on. Love thine own soul and comfort thy heart. Remove sorrow far from thee, for sorrow hath killed many, and there is, there is none and there's no profit therein. Right. So, you know, I often think of this one when it comes like for times to mourn. The scripture says don't mourn for too long because then you're going to give yourself. So it's not to say that sorrow won't come. It says, but you have to. There's a spirit in every emotion. Sorrow has its purpose. But the spirit will not want to move on if you don't push it out. So you got to let it go. So let the sorrow come. Deal with it. Let it do what it's supposed to do. And then move. You know what Esau calls that? The stages of grief. Mm -hmm. The state till you get to resolution and all that stuff like that. They name it that. That's you taking ownership and control spiritually of this stuff. Apply the scriptures. Don't leave yourself in heaviness. Some people are like, oh, I can't get over this. I can't get over that. Hey, really, it's just a matter of self-control 
And it says one of the ways you do that is push it far away from you. What does that mean? Do you forget the loved one that you lost? No. But maybe for a time, you have to. And then later, you bring those memories back in when they're not so painful. That's why it says keep it far from thee, right? Whatever it is that's going to help you get through that, just don't let it overcome you. Come on. Envy and wrath shorten the life. And carefulness bringeth age before the time. You hear that? Envy and wrath shorten the life. So people who are always angry, don't want to do anything about it. Your anger's a warm blanket. It says it's going to shorten your life. Envy, you got an envious spirit, which is covetousness as well. And carefulness, worry. Everybody, you're always worried. It says it'll bring age before the time. See how the presidents, they go into the office, they're looking all young. By the time they're done, they look, and not even by the time they're done, like halfway through their term, they all jacked up. They don't look the same. Like, my gosh, when they were running, they didn't look, they looked so full of life. That thing will suck the life out of you. All that evil that's around you that you're doing, that. <laughs> the president of the United States, come on. It says it mess you up. So it says, carefulness bring of age before the time. Come on. A cheerful and good heart will have a care. For his meat and diet. And you know, there's a lot in that verse, right? I don't want to stay harp on it too long. There's a lot in that verse. Um, but on the surface, you could just say, when your mind is right, you'll be able to take a care of your meat and diet. Um, I'll put it like this. You ever hear people who be, they eat because they're depressed? Or they eat because they're sad, right? So, for example, you had different types of people, how they dealt with breakups. I knew some women, when they broke up, they had to go out and party with their girlfriends and put it all on social media and put it all out there. I don't need him. Ooh, look, I'm having fun with my girls. All right? Meanwhile, they cut up and hurt inside. Right? So they're showing out that way. Some would eat. Be like, oh my gosh, she gained 40 pounds in a month because she was depressed because her man left her. She gained 40 pounds. Right? Uh, if, you're, if your mind and your spirit ain't right, you're not going to want to have the discipline to be careful with your diet. Right? And what you put into inside of yourself. Uh, if you see the whole picture together, it'll be easier to maintain your compliance and whatever your goals are. So mental health has a big part to do with it. Let me get Sirach 31 and let's start at verse 12. The book of Sirach chapter 31 and verse 12. If thou sit at a bountiful table, be not greedy upon it and say not there is much meat on it. Right. Like I was saying, the brothers here... It would be a sister's event, and they lining up at the table for their food. First of all, the sisters is going to look out for the security that's here to secure them for the thing. Brothers was getting hip to that and hanging out here after MOV, and then like, well, I'm a ranking man. I'm, let, me, let me get in line for my... Sisters made the food for them for their event. L listen, if the sisters is right, they're going to offer to the men that's here securing the place for them. And they almost always do. I don't know of a time where they haven't. Brothers is trying to line up because you saw a bountiful table. You went up there. Ooh, man, I'm going to get up there. Right? This is why we do things with the food with order. Right? Who was telling me? Uh, I forgot, man. I was having a conversation with somebody. You know, it might have been Wilkin, now that I think about it. Because it was in the car, I think. It was with Wilkin. Remember my uh, nephew that was visiting. Um, and... We were talking about the Bible and certain things, and I forgot how the food came up and the order in which he served food. And he was saying, like, that that would be a weird thing in DR if that the kids and the women were waiting. He goes, you know, maybe the men would slide, like you serve the men. He was like, but, like, that the, the kids are waiting to the end and all this, and like, the way he does the order and stuff. And he was saying, like, that would be strange over there. Like, he would have theas that would be like cause this, right? So, um Little subtle things like that actually carry over into your health too, right? Because there's an order and a structure to it. It actually creates a disciplined home, what we do here when it comes to that stuff, in the order in which things are done. Not getting into the whole thing that kids should not be first in the house. We've had, I remember a while back we had sisters, it wasn't here, I don't think, I think it was in New York, and uh, they was tight because the kids would have to wait to the end to eat. Like, how come the kids ain't eating first? And it's little things that are out of sync create an overarching effect in our mental health. That's not the right order of things, how things are done. Kids are not the most important thing in the house. And this is from a father that loves his kids to death. I mean, like, my children are like, Pfft. but I, I got my order. They ain't eating before me. They not getting the big piece of chicken, right? 
daddy going to be taken care of first. And they need to learn that as well. Maybe I'm a little loose when all the cousins are there. I don't try to, f maybe it's because so many of them, because was it 12 at one time when they were older? I'm not trying to, all right, are you oldest? Are you oldest? Are you, you know, but I'll be like, all right, let me just get the boys first. I don't care what order it's in, and then I'll get the girls, and that's it, right? You know, but we should keep that type of order and structure with them as we go throughout. And then it will avoid behavior like this when you see a bountiful table and go, oh, there's much meat. I told you at a time that one brother, when we did the, uh, uh, Pentecost in New York. You know who I'm talking about, Lasagna Man, mm -hmm. all right? And uh, <laughs> well, I think some people have heard the lasagna story. I think here, but not everybody. Sure. Well, I went and I'm cooking this stuff, right? Uh, it was one of the f first tabernacles we started doing at Parks in New York. And the brother, I was cooking some sausage, like you know, a chicken sausage, turkey, kielbasa, whatever. And uh, it was like basically the first rounds of food for like the people that got there early. And I put it all in the tray, and as people were coming, I was like, hey, you know, you could grab some of this or whatever. And then uh, someone was like, hey, there's nothing there. I said, no, 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 there's no way there's nothing there. I cooked it. It was like freaking 20 packs of, and there's only like five people here. How is there nothing there? It's like 20 packs of freaking meat, and there's five people here. I haven't had none yet, so how the hell is there not nothing left? And I went, and lo and behold, the tray was empty. So we're looking around, we're looking around. And I'm sorry, I'm not trying to say this to be disrespectful, but he lived the stereotype. I looked for the fat brother. And the fat brother's walking over there with the plate. And he wasn't just a fat brother. He was known for this type of behavior. So, so, and I'm like, I said, hey, bro, come here. He's like, what? And he was taller than me, right? So he's holding the plate like this. He's holding the plate like this. So I'm standing in front of him here, and he's holding the plate like this so that like, I can't see what's on his plate. And I said, bro, did you take all the sausages? Nah, nah, I didn't take all the sausages. I said, yo, let me see the plate. So I'm going like this, and he's fighting me. Like, I can't put a plate down. So then I think he realizes that if I keep doing that, the plate and the sausage is going to fly. So he lets it go. Man, that thing, he had grease because he was holding it up here. It tipped onto his chest. I said, bro. I, but we, we, we all cursed him out. We said, you're not in the spirit. There's other brothers here for you to share with and stuff like that. He's like, oh, well, I saw that it was a lot. I thought you had more. I said, damn, every time I read this scripture, I think of that brother. I think of that brother. I think of that brother. Um, jump to verse, I was 12. Go to 16. Verse 16. Eat as it becometh a man, those things which are set before thee, and devour not, lest thou be hated. Right? So it says, hey, eat as it becometh a man. Right? So I know sometimes we're sitting there and be like, ah, I got a manly appetite. Ah, I'm going to eat the whole chicken. No, it says, eat as become of a man, right, which uh, what's set before it says, devour not, lest thou be hated. Because people are going to start to look at you and be like, damn, look at the way, that you ever have somebody that just smacked it the way they're eating? It's like, damn, come up for air, bro, what's wrong with you, right? So come on, read. Verse 17, leave off first for manner's sake, and be not unsatiable. Lest thou offend. Right, so it says, hey, leave off first for manner's sake. Don't try to be the first. Unless we're doing the thing in order, don't try to be the first one in there to grab something, right? For manner's sake. And it says, and be not unsatiable. To be unsatiable means you can't be satisfied. Like the brother that, you know, maybe should have started with two sausages and go from there. My man took like more than half the packs of meat that was there, right? Come on. When thou sittest among many, reach not thine hand out first of all. Right? Don't be the one sticking your hand in the bread, going through all the bread to get the piece you want. <laughs> the brother know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Don't be going in there trying to... <laughs> he didn't even realize that he did it, bro, until he was called out on it. Come on. A very little is sufficient for a man well nurtured. And he fetcheth not his wind short upon his bed. Right? He says very little is sufficient for a man well nurtured. Now, very little is relative, right? Uh, if if a brother's, you know, twice my size, chances are a little for him is going to maybe be like double what it is for me, right? But the point is, don't overeat. Don't try to, you don't have to do them. You know how I be when we get to our gatherings, Jake gatherings, the, the paper plate is, sometimes I don't know how they hold up to the pressure, right? <laughs> they just, that thing is mounds and mounds of food on there, right? I know we want a little of everything. We want a little taste of everything. But how about a little of everything and not a lot? Of everything, right? So be mindful of that stuff. Come on. Sound sleep cometh of moderate eating. He riseth early, and his wits are with him. Right? So sound sleep, we know that. You know, from a, from a perspective of comfort, when you eat too late, you, your sleep's not going to be as good, right? You're going to be jacked up. Um, I know if I eat 
uh, too close to when I go to bed. I won't say late, but because I could eat late, and if I'm up for two or three more hours, I'm okay. But if let's say I eat and like an hour later I go to bed, right, I'm probably going to have heartburn, right? So you got to be mindful of that stuff. So it says, sound sleep cometh of moderate eating. Come on. He riseth early, and his wits are with him. But the pain of watching and choler and pangs of the belly are with an insatiable man. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of intestinal issues. There's things like that. Sometimes, not always, right, it might be because of your eating habits and how, and how you uh, consume things, right? So we got to be mindful of that type of stuff. Uh, jump to verse 25. Verse 25. Show not thy valiantness. Valiantness. In wine, for wine hath destroyed many. Valiantness is like bravery, courage, alcohol, right? You ever heard of liquid courage, right? It says, so we went over diet, right? Also, alcohol deals with health, right? And there's a lot of, maybe, maybe you're a good eater, but you got a thing when it comes to the drink. It says, show not thy valiantness in wine, right? Because you start drinking. And now you feel like you're strong, right? You're more bold. It says, for wine have destroyed many. And it says wine here, but we're talking about any type of alcohol, right? Be mindful of it. Come on. The furnace proveth the edge by dipping. So doth wine the hearts of the proud by drunkenness. It says the furnace proveth the edge by dipping. So it's talking about um, like when you're doing blacksmithing, right? The edge of the sword, you put it in there, right? And you'll see if it can resist it or not, if it's ready, if, the, if it starts to melt too much, it's not ready. They go back, they hammer it some more, right, to kind of meld the steel together. It says the same thing does wine in the hearts of the proud by drunkenness. I'm not drunk. Nah, nah, I'm good. I can hold my liquor. That's what it's talking about. And wine is going to prove that that, that behavior is not. I'm telling you, it's the most, it's a stereotype that is probably one of the most accurate there is. When someone has gotten to that point where it's too much, they're going to start to get belligerent and defensive and say that it's not too much, even though you can see outwardly that it is, right? And they're going to say no. So it says the, the drink, it's going to go ahead and uh, read that part again. No, sort of the wine, the hearts of the proud by drunkenness. It says it will prove you, right? Come on, read verse 27. Wine is as good as life to a man if it be drunk moderately. So it's fine. It's okay to drink if it's done in moderation. And in moderation means you don't get to that point where your behavior changes so much. And you can really tell when somebody's gotten past that point when their behavior starts to change. Come on. What life is then to a man that is without wine? For it is made to make men glad. So it says it is made for that, right? So yes, a drink is supposed to give you some mirth. It'll relax you. It'll bring you down, especially wine. They say like, you know, a glass of red wine every night is safe, is healthy, what phytophenols or whatever they say is in there. Um, it's good for you, but too much is not good. It says, but drink is there for us to make us mad, to, glad, to give you mirth, right? Come on. Wine measurably drunk. Wine measurably drunk. And in season. And in season, meaning maybe this isn't the venue or the place for you to have three drinks. Maybe you should only have one. Maybe you should, maybe you should have none, depending on the context of where you're at. Knowing how your behavior might be. And measurably so. Don't be the one to fill up your glass. Listen, uh, uh, a standard measure is like, I think, one ounce or two ounces, right, of, of like a drink, right? I'm not a pro at alcohol, right, but... Some people go and they'll take like the whiskey or the vodka or whatever and they'll take like a regular cup. We're not, we fasten so we don't have the cup here, but a cup will be this big. They'll fill that thing up to here. You know damn well that's not measurably drunk and just, and just finish that thing like it's apple juice. You know, like you see, because that's what it is in movies when they're drinking like a big drink like that. It's like apple juice or something and it'll look like drink. And you think it because in the movies they just threw that back that you good, right? That's not measurably drunk, right? Normal portions, right? Don't be there with the bottle, right? Normal portions, normal glass size. Just because the glass got this much room in there don't mean the alcohol got to go up that high. You can keep it right down here, right? Look at that, wine, beer. <laughs> no, you got to do a clear glass and show you. If you want to get a visual, look for a visual of uh, like a standard shot. It's 
ice. Right, it's the ice. It's not that much, it's the ice, right? Anyway, uh, go ahead, read on. We're going to go all the way down to verse 31. Wine measurably drunk and in season bringeth gladness of the heart and cheerfulness of the mind. Right, so if you do it right, it will bring gladness of the heart and cheerfulness of the minds. It's good. It's okay to, to drink, right? Come on. But wine drunken with excess maketh bitterness of the mind. Ooh, not only does it make you proud and courageous, it makes bitterness in your mind. I know that. I, that, I never liked that person. This one here. Oh, I know that one's always talking about me. And then, boom, the combination of the alcohol and everything else. Forget it. Come on. With brawling and quarreling, drunkenness increaseth the rare of a fool. The rage. The rage of a fool till he offends. Right? Hey, and I'm telling you, it'll bring out anger in people. That's not a master. Remember, this whole thing ties together because we want to master our moods. So if you know that you're drinking something that can make you happy, but if it's drunk unmeasurably and out of season can actually alter your mood, then you are not practicing the fruits of self-control. And, and again, maybe, for example, maybe I'm home with my wife. Kids are maybe at the system. I could have three drinks. Maybe together we could have three drinks, right, each. Okay? But if the kids are home, maybe we only do one or two. Or maybe, maybe we're not doing it at all, right? And I'm saying that because you would think that's a safe space. It's me and her. We could have three together, right? We're not going to get drunk and fight each other. I hope not. <laughs> right? <laughs> Stop beating each other up. <laughs> then that's okay to drink a little more, right? Maybe it's not. If I'm at a friend's house, maybe I shouldn't have that many, right? I mean, even if I think the friend's going to look out for me, like... I don't know. That's, if you get drunk at my house, man, I think that's a little disrespectful. Don't get drunk at my house. All right? Remember that this day. If I ever have you over and we have drinks, don't get drunk at my house. Because I don't care that we in the truth or whatever. I'm going to kick your ass out. I do not want vomit in my house. I don't want shit broken. Part of my language. I don't want... <laughs> you got to you gotta edit that out now. Right? Hey, hey. Go ahead. Captain. Oh, go ahead. Real quick. Also, you got to understand a lot of these brothers are coming in the truth. I know a couple brothers that have never drunk before. Right. And... You brothers that are coming from the streets, y'all drink like nothing. And what happens is you cause your brother to stumble. Meaning, guess what? You go over there, pour your drink, and you got like a half a cup. That brother says, oh, so that's how they do it? Okay, I'm going to do it too. And then the brother's acting, falling asleep in the restroom, or that brother's over there uh, just acting crazy loud, or want to go talk to the sisters and act stupid. You know what I mean? You got to use that wisdom on yourself. You're going right. to cause your brother to stumble. Right. So sometimes when you're, when you're there, just to use that wisdom and say, you know what? I'm not going to drink that much. I'm going to take it yeah. easy. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not this brother right here. I'm talking, talking to him. He doesn't drink. I don't want him to jump on the wagon with me. You know what I mean? What? Well, watch. Later is going to talk about how to even deal with a drunk person. What were you going to say, Isaac? Come on, because I got more scriptures to get to. We got 20 minutes. I was going to say, not, not only that, about like throwing up in the house and all that, but they still got to drive home because they're not at the Right, house. right. Well, yeah, and I don't even think you got to consider that piece of it, too. That's right. I wasn't even thinking of that. I was thinking being selfish. I don't want you vomit in my house. <laughs> read on it diminisheth strength and maketh wounds right you think you're strong you're not stronger when you're drunk i'm gonna beat your behind even even more than if you were sober <laughs> rebuke not thy neighbor at the wine and despise him not in his mirth so now don't be a party pooper and if somebody's moderate in their drinking let them be right so you can't be quick to snap to judgment either right so it says, uh, you know, don't offend them in their mirth, right? Despise them not in his mirth. If, if, if they're at that point where they've, it still seems controlled or whatever, and they're having a good time, let them be. But then it also says, rebuke not thy neighbor at the wine. Twofold here. If you're drinking, don't be trying to correct people. And you have to be mindful that the person is drunk and how you approach them and deal with that behavior. Because remember, they're going to be on liquid courage. They're going to be valiant. So there's a way to speak to them and try to deal with them. I'm not saying it's always going to work, but you, 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 you got to come different realizing they're not in control of their mood, right? Or their actions fully at that point. Come on. Give him no despiteful words and press not upon him with urging him to drink. Right. Ah, and that's the other side of it too, right? So it says, don't be there trying to give them more and more and more. If you see, cut them off. And those of you who are sober now as you listen to this class, try to remember that when you're drinking and somebody try to cut you off, all right? It's not because somebody's trying to vex you or mess up your mirth, 
We're trying to apply the scriptures here and make sure that it doesn't get to that type of behavior, right? And again, I say this again, the burden of you men in position, it shouldn't be right for any brother or sister, but even more so if you hold a rank, be mindful of how you carry yourself in environments where you're drinking. Because of that, I almost never drink hardly ever at the feast days because I don't want to get that far, right? Because I could, on the low, because, right, I consider it, it's me. I'm the captain of 3,000. People might be a little squeamish about telling me something. I could throw back four or five before somebody tells me, well, Cap, you know, maybe, right? Out of respect. And I consider that. And I don't want to put that on anybody. So I make sure I keep myself all right. I'm not trying to get crazy here, right? And guess what? I know I got to drive. So I got to time it so that it's not in my system so that I can leave, right? And remember, you don't got to be like sloppy drunk to get a DUI out here, right? You, you could be... Totally fine, just not enough time has passed since, since your body's been digesting it and you're going to get in trouble. Facts. So be mindful of that. Uh, let's get um, Sirach. No, we did that one. Hold on. Why do I have that here again? 30, 29. No, that's not right. It was 31, 29 through 31. Uh, no. The one with dainty sweets. What about dainties? I put 30. It's not 30. I messed up. Uh, yeah, on dainties, something yeah, about dainties. You got it? Which are rock chapter 37, verse 29. 37, verse 29, please. Thank you. Be not unsatiable in any dainty thing, nor too greedy upon meats. See, this is me. I'm not greedy on meats. I like meats. But sweets. <laughs> I, I, I can be unsatiable with sweets, man. Hey, I know I always talk about Oreos. Uh, I've rediscovered the Keebler fudge grams. Whoever had those, the fudge grams. Ooh, you, yo, you throw them in the fridge. You ever throw them in? The, well, in the fridge they hit, bro. Let me tell you something. I'll do a line of those. Those, those. They, <laughs> don't get them. Don't get them. <laughs> them things are delicious. You have no idea. My kids is feeding for them. My son the other day was trying to climb the fridge like Spider Man, trying to get to one. Cause I put him in the top top shelf so that he don't. Yeah, man. He was like. <laughs> and then I caught him, and he was like hanging there like, Daddy, I want chocolate. I said, <laughs> man, he got me mad the other day. He went in there, took one of my Reese's peanut butter cups. I almost threw him out the house. <laughs> you, got, you got an 850 credit score? Go live on your own. <laughs> so <laughs> dainty things, right, with sweets. That, I, listen, I, I, I'm not ashamed. That's me. That's, that's why I don't have a six-pack. It's sweets. Come on. For excess of meat bringeth sickness, and surfeiting will turn into choler. Right. Yeah, this is true. Right. You can eat too much of that stuff, and you're going to be messed up. Come on. By surfeiting, many have many perished, but he that taketh heed prolongeth his life. Right. And surfeiting is like really like gluttony, right? Like that's excess, right? I know everybody perceives that different. Uh, yes, we should all eat more vegetables and all that. I'm not going to get into the whole, eh, what's better, what's not. Listen. Just be mindful. Surfeiting means like extreme. Like I'm a, I'm gonna have a steak and I'm gonna be okay. But if you have an issue with cholesterol, hey, some people could eat a red meat every day and not have a problem. If you have a known issue, then maybe you shouldn't. Right? It's just I'm not. I don't like to make blanket statements on stuff. Okay? Be mindful of that stuff and just don't overdo it. Right? Again, just like with the alcohol, moderation. Everything is moderation, right? And then, of course, if you have medical factors to consider, be mindful of that also. Uh, let's get Ciroc 38 and 1. What time is it? We good. We try to get through this. Ciroc 38 and 1. The book of Ciroc, chapter 38, verse 1. Honor a physician with the honor due unto him for the uses which he may have of him. For the Lord hath created him. Now, it says, honor the physician, honor the physician. It says, for the uses you may have of him. Uh, sometimes there might not be a use for them, right? I know we have this thing, and, uh, and it's, it's not unwarranted that we're against doctors and stuff like that. Uh, you have to understand that the Lord created him. The Lord allows that science and that medicine to be there. And I think a lot of people forget that last part when it says, give honor unto the physician. Oh, don't go to a doctor. Don't do this. Don't do that. I, I would, again, using the example that they gave with the alcohol, there's a season for it. There's a time for it. There's a moderation for it and how you deal with that. Um, but yeah, because you got some people on the extreme end that they live in urgent care. They live, you know, hypochondriacs, everything that's always wrong. They're going to get checked out. And then you got others 
not even the physician, but they won't go see the dentist. And your mouth is jacked up, and you're saying it's genetics and it's bad teeth, and it's not. It's just you're nasty, and you don't have good oral care, and you haven't been to the dentist in 10 years. Go to the dentist, have them fix you. Every time I go, they pull a tooth. It's because you're nasty, and you don't say. It's not because the dentist is just there pulling teeth. You did something to that point that, that got your tooth pulled. Your teeth just don't go bad. That's not true. You got to brush them. Right? And listen, whether you're pro fluoride or not, guess what? You don't even need toothpaste to brush your teeth. It's the mechanical action of disrupting the bacteria that actually gets the job done. I like that. Hey, I, listen, I have my uh, degree in applied science and dental hygiene, so I know quite the, I didn't know you could cut a teeth down into all these different things and stuff like that in layers to see all that stuff. It's brushing. We just, we're grown up with toothpaste is soap. If you read it, there's a thing in there, there's detergent in toothpaste, right? In your common toothpaste. I'm not saying it's necessarily bad or not for you, but we're used to the foamy action and everything, the taste, and that's really more the purpose that it serves. Yes, soap helps to kind of let things not adhere to surfaces and stuff, but you can do just as good a job without the toothpaste and just brushing, right? But anyway, the point is, honor these things and go do this stuff. You wait until you're jacked up, and then you go, and hell yeah, it hurts to get a tooth pulled. Ain't there, you just, even if you numbed up, you feeling your, they pulling your tooth out, just take care of yourself. That goes for anything. Stop trying to, what, what, don't wait till you get broken to go to the, hell yeah, you're not going to like the doctor if you go there when you're broken. Try to be more holistic with, with your approach. Um, read verse two. Verse two. For of the most high cometh healing, and he shall re receive honor of the king. Healing, first and foremost, is of God. But sometimes God does that through the hand of the physician. So you can't sit there and expect that, especially if you know you ain't all the way right, that God is just going to heal you. Be like, oh, God, I got diabetes. Take it away from me. And that that's going to be the end of it. No, maybe he will. But you got to go and get your insulin or whatever regimen that they're going to put you on. In the meantime, and then you pray and you fast. And I'm not saying he won't do it in one shot for you, but chances are he ain't doing that for a lot of us in one shot, right? So healing is of God, but sometimes God will use the hand of the physician, but it's still God. It's not the doctor that healed you. It's God because it said the Lord created them. So we got to be mindful of that because, you got again, you got extremes with that. Nope, God's going to heal me. I don't need to go see somebody. No. What if God wants you to see somebody to heal you? And that's the way he's going to do it. Be mindful of that stuff. So Rock 38 and 4. 38 and 4? Uh, yeah. Verse 4. Three, I don't need that. The Lord hath created medicines out of the earth, and he that is wise will not abhor them. Right? So there's medicines out of the earth. Yes, go in, try to, under we did the radio show with Sister Safia. You can't just blanket take stuff, all right? If you believe, this, this is my thing, if you believe the stuff is strong enough to help you, then it's also strong enough to hurt you if you don't know what you're doing, right? So be mindful of the herbs and the things like that. And also understand that many of the synthesized medicines come from base ingredients of these things and they're, and they're just um, concentrated, right? So you can't just blanketly say that all medicine is bad. There has to be a, a more balanced approach to how you view health and things like that. And it's dangerous, again, when we run around saying those type of things, knowing that sometimes some people hang on our every word, depending on the position that you're in. So be mindful of how you say and give that type of advice. Jump to verse 9. Verse 9. My son, in thy sickness be not negligent. But pray unto the Lord that he make thee whole. That's part of health. In your sickness, be not negligent to pray unto God. So don't be so reliant on medicine and the doctors and the herbs that you forget the part where you pray to God, coupled with all those other things, to bring you healing, to bring you health. Come on, read. Leave off from sin and order thine hands aright and cleanse thy heart from all wickedness. Check yourself. Do an assessment. And make sure that there's not some things that you need to shore up. Maybe, maybe, I'm not saying always, but maybe you're sick because of sin. Not always, but maybe. So don't be negligent to do that assessment and do that check and pray to God, ask for forgiveness, right? Uh, jump to verse 12. We're going to do 12 and 13. 
then give place to the physician. Pray, leave off from sin, then give place to the physician. So it's letting you, yes, there's, there's a spiritual component to the healing, but then it says after you do all this stuff, give place to the physician. Come on. For the Lord hath created him. Reminding you again that God created him. Come on. Let him not go from thee, for thou hast need of him. So don't shun the doctors. It says you may have need of them sometimes. Come on. There is a time when in their hands there is good success. That means sometimes in their hands there is good success. There is a time when, it, meaning that sometimes there's not a good success with them also. But it also means that there is a time when in their hands you're going to have good success. But it's a holistic approach. Don't go to the doctor without the prayers. Don't pray and not go to the doctor either. Look at the whole picture. Do the whole thing. All right. There is a time when you need the doctor. First Timothy four and eight. Got a few more scriptures. First Timothy chapter four and verse eight. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Right. So exercise. It doesn't say there's no profit to it. It was a there was a time we came into the truth and I was like, see, I don't know why you guys exercise so much. Bodily exercise, probably little. Don't put that before everything else, but exercise. Common sense. The Bible tells you there is some profit in that, right? So remember, we're thinking about maintaining good health. Deuteronomy 23 and 10. Guess what else goes with health? And this, usually this is brothers more than sisters, but you probably have had some uh, unhygienic sisters. But some of you brothers have very bad hygiene habits. And it's not just your mouth. It's your taint. It's your crack. It's your feet. It's your clothes. It's your hair. It's your ears. Trim your nose hairs. Uh, unkempt, nasty, looking homeless sometimes. The hell is wrong with you? And you think you're going to get a wife that way? Or you think you're going to be able to put on a show long enough to get a wife? Wash your behind. Come on, read this. Deuteronomy 23 and 10. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 10. If there be among you any man that is not clean by reason of uncleanness that chanceth him by night, then shall he go abroad out of the camp. He shall not come within the camp. If you continue to be nasty and dirty after being spoken to and unhygienic, you need to go without the camp. It means you need to be put out. That was the law back then. You were dirty. You had to be put out the camp. Because why? Sickness and disease can come from that stuff. You nasty and dirty. Read the next verse. But it shall be when evening cometh on, he shall wash himself with water. Wash yourself. When you're dirty, wash yourself. Come on. And when the sun is down, he shall come into the camp again. So if we got to put you out because you unhygienic, once you wash your behind, you can come back. All right. That's part of good health. That's in the Bible, brothers and sisters. The Bible covers everything. All right. The Bible covers it. First Corinthians 619. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy that you should have to have multiple conversations by multiple brothers with a brother about washing yourself I mean I don't know what upbringing you had but now you, you're learning this place is about change right wash your mind it's, it's sad that we would even have to bring a scripture to prove that you need to wash yourself to be amongst us come on First, first Corinthians 6 and 19 sorry. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 what Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Your body is a gift of God. Yes, even this weekly, some of us sickly body, my short behind. Listen, God gave it to me, all right? That's our temple. So if it's our temple, we should treat it as such because it's a gift from God. You know how disrespectful, how, how insulting it is if you give a gift to somebody and you see that they ain't using it? Or they throw it on the side, or don't, right? Don't you feel offended if you give somebody a gift? They like, or or you give somebody a gift and they re-gift it. Now you real offended, right? The hell is this? So if our body is a gift from God, we should take care of it as such, right? We only got one in this lifetime, right? So let's let's hold on to it and do right by it. Ephesians two and ten. The book of Ephesians, chapter two and verse ten. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Yes, even our physical selves are his workmanship. 
So yes, this is going heavily into the spiritual side of things, but guess what? Our terrestrial forms, this body that we're in, even with my chichos, that's a gift from God. All right? <laughs> you, got, you got some flaps and some extra skin? That's a gift from God. Your body's a gift from God. You feel bad about it? Fix it so he can show that you're doing right with it, okay? And you'll be all right. Let me get Wisdom of Solomon 16 and 12, and then uh, after that, Sirach 118, and then we're done. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 16 and verse 12. For it was neither herb nor, nor mollifying plaster that restored them to health. But thy word, O Lord, which healeth all things. Let's not undercount. Remember, uh, it's not to say that we don't do those things, but don't put so much trust in the herb and the mollifying plaster. Remember what I said earlier, those things go in conjunction with your faith in God and those prayers. That's why I said don't be negligent to pray to him when you're ill, right? That's what restores us to help. It's God's word. I'm not going to sit up here like a nut and say in these last days it's only that. We know in Christ's time, he was healing. The disciples were able to heal. There were prophets that were able to heal. Right now, our faith is not on that level. There's nobody's faith here that is strong enough that we have spiritual power to heal. Not saying it, it may not happen in our lifetimes, but understand that where the healing comes from. Don't say it was because the herb. Don't say it was that. You can put all that together, but it's because of that. One more scripture. Read it. Sirach 118. Sirach chapter like 1 verse yet. 18. He's stretching there. So Rock 118. The fear of the Lord is a crown of wisdom, making peace and perfect health to flourish, both which are the gifts of God, and it, it enlargeth their rejoicing that love him. It says peace and perfect health are gifts of God. And it says when they enlarge it, right, you enlarge it, and that's rejoicing in your love to him, meaning work on that. Work on the peace of your mind. Work on your health, work on all these fruits of self-control, and by that, you're glorifying the Most High God. All right? Understand that. I pray you got some understanding from all this. All right? We used to scream black power while Heron was pushed. But at the end of the day, nothing's in vain. IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission, minor murmuring, omitting, and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road, purple and gold, from Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone. 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling. These are how we're men repented at heart. The scriptures is proof, I-U-I-C, we deliver the truth.